They pursued him through the forest, but he jumped into a marsh and sat there underwater for several hours. How did he survive? He managed to find a way to breathe through a hollow stem of a reed. He could hear the Nazi Germans walking right past him as their search dogs barked, but they never found him. The man in question was Vladimir Putin, not the current Russian president, but his father. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today we have a fascinating subject to discuss, and that is one of the most powerful leaders in the world, Vladimir Putin, from one of the most interesting countries in the world, Russia, and of course I'm biased. I was born and raised in that country, but we're not going to discuss his leadership style or any of the current events. We will be looking at Putin's path to the KGB. Before we jump in, I truly would appreciate you subscribing and sharing this video so that I could eventually land in the algorithm, have more visibility, and make content like this on a more regular basis. Now, with that out of the way, let's jump into the story. The incident that I just described took place, obviously, during World War II. At that time, the president's father worked for a defense enterprise, so he was actually exempt uh, from conscription and didn't have to go to the front, but he volunteered. He ended up in an NKVD sabotage detachment. NKVD was the state security services and the predecessor of the KGB. Putin Sr.'s group had 28 members, and they would carry out diversions and acts of sabotage in the Nazi German rear, like blowing up bridges and railway tracks. Now, in this case, it was quite apparent that the group was betrayed. They were ambushed by Nazi German soldiers right away. So Vladimir Putin Sr. escaped quite miraculously because of the 28 group members, 24 perished. Later, Putin Sr. fought in Leningrad. The city was besieged for approximately 900 days by Nazi Germany and its allies like Finland, one of the longest and most destructive sieges in recorded history of warfare. Estimates vary, but up to a million people died from deliberate and systematic starvation and related illnesses. On November 7th, 1941, Putin Sr. was seriously wounded by an enemy grenade in the German rear, and he ended up living with shrapnel in his leg his entire life and various health issues because of that. Eventually, he was awarded for Battle Merit Medal for this event. Now, it occurred at Nevsky Pitachok. Pitachok is in reference to a five, I guess the equivalent is cent coin, so it's quite small. Then the Neva River bridgehead outside of Leningrad, present day St. Petersburg where some of the most significant and bloody battles took place during the siege. In a 2015 article for Ruski Pioneer, Russian Pioneer magazine, Vladimir Putin wrote, quote, It was likely the hottest place of the entire siege. Our troops held a small foothold, four kilometers wide, and a little over two kilometers deep. It was assumed that this would be a springboard for a future breakthrough of the siege, but this area did not end up being used for this purpose. The siege was broken elsewhere. Nevertheless, they held onto this patch, this coin-sized territory, for a long time. There was heavy fighting, very heavy. The area was surrounded by 
dominating heights so the enemy could shoot right through it from a higher elevation. The Germans too, of course, understood that a possible breakthrough could take place there and they tried to simply wipe Nevsky Petachok off the face of the earth. There is scientific data on how much metal is buried in each square meter of this land. It's still solid metal." Unquote. After getting hit, Putin Sr. eventually came to. This was the middle of winter in St. Petersburg, a northern city, and Neva, the river, was frozen. He managed to reach the Soviet troops on one side of the river, but nobody wanted to drag him across the ice under enemy fire in, you know, on, on flat ground and full view to get medical attention on the opposite shore. Then for Putin Sr. came another stroke of luck. His neighbor from Peterhof, which is a historic place outside of Leningrad, where Putin Sr. lived at one point, ended up in the area by chance, by pure accident. So the neighbor dragged the wounded man all the way to the hospital, and he survived. So after a successful surgery, the neighbor's parting words were, now you will live, but I'm off to die. It was not until the 1960s that Putin's senior, by pure chance, once again ran into his neighbor in a store, reconnected with him, and later came home and simply cried. During the siege of Leningrad, uh, Putin's older brother, Viktor, was only three years old. His mother, Maria, would visit her wounded husband at the hospital and they would sneak out his hospital food to feed the, the little boy in a city that was starving. And the hospital staff did not realize what was happening until the wounded man started fainting from hunger. Then the little boy Victor was to be evacuated from the city like many other children to safety. However, he got sick, he got diphtheria and he died. His parents never knew where he was buried. It was not until the 2000s that this information was discovered in the archives. After the child was taken away for his eventual evacuation that he never made it to, Putin's mother, Maria, was left completely alone as her husband was still recovering from his wounds in the hospital. Eventually, he came home on crutches and he realized that some orderlies were taking dead bodies out of his apartment building and in fact he recognized that his wife was amongst the corpses but she was still breathing. As a historic note for context from November 1941, the daily rations for Leningrad area laborers who did hard physical labor was only 250 grams of bread so just about half a pound of bread for the entire day and it was only 125 grams of bread for everyone else these were the worst days of the siege uh, as far as starvation goes as well and in december 1941 alone approximately 50,000 people died of starvation the orderlies told Putin Sr. that the woman would die along the way anyway, and it's pointless, but he didn't listen to them. In fact, he nearly attacked them with his crutches and demanded that they take her back to their apartment. So they did. And he took care of her, and somehow she survived. So in fact, Putin Sr. died in 1998, and she passed the next year. So they lived quite a long life after the horrors of World War II. It was not until 1952 that at age 41, Maria had Vladimir Putin, who became later the president of the Russian Federation. 
So now that we've looked at what in some ways could be described uh, Vladimir Putin's unlikely birth in light of his parents' close calls and his uh, older brother's death, let's consider one more relevant family member of the Putin family as far as his childhood goes. In fact, Vladimir Putin has always been quite frank about his background. So, for example, in the year 2000, there was a book that came out called First Person, an astonishingly frank self-portrait by Russia's president. And the book involved hours of interviews with the newly minted, minted Russian leader who was picked by the first post-Soviet president, Boris Yeltsin, as a side note. In the opinion of many, that was one of the only, if not the only good things that Boris Yeltsin did uh, in the context of the 1990s neoliberal nightmare into which Russia plunged. Uh, in part, of course, that was Yeltsin's fault. So the uh, prominent family member in question is Putin's grandfather, Spiridon. He was a cook. But he was not a regular cook because he first worked and prepared meals for Vladimir Lenin, the father of the 1917 Russian Revolution. And then he went on to work for Joseph Stalin, who arguably at one point was the most powerful man in the world as the leader of the Soviet Union for quite a long time. So it's quite likely that because Spiridon worked with the highest echelons of power and he worked with food, that he was probably a staff member of the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs, the aforementioned NKVD, state security, and the predecessor of the KGB. So considering that he prepared meals specifically for Joseph Stalin, he was undoubtedly observed very, very, very closely to ensure that there is no funny business, obviously such as attempts to poison the powerful leader of the Soviet Union. German journalist Alexander Rahr writes in his book, Der Deutsche im Kreml, which means a German in the Kremlin, in reference to Putin being a Germanophile, speaking German, and spending quite a bit of time in East Germany in the 1980s. Quote, Portraits of Politburo, Political Bureau, the Executive Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, members decorated the pages of textbooks and posters. As a result, their faces were familiar to any Soviet student. Lenin Brezhnev, the leader of the Communist Party and the head of state, was listed first. Then came Alexei Kasygin, the chair of the Council of Ministers. Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov, at one point both had direct links to the Leningrad military industrial complex, and Mikhail Suslov. In the context of the Kremlin Olympus, the latter man had the reputation of a gray cardinal, responsible for the purity and consistency of the communist ideology. But Vladimir Putin probably remembered the face of the 50-year-old Yuri Andropov best. In 1967, the latter was appointed as the head of the KGB. Five years later, he became a member of the Politburo upon Brezhnev's insistence. This was a sure sign that the political influence of the organization that he headed, which at one point became the dark symbol of Stalin's dictatorship, had grown. Of course, at that point, Putin could not even imagine that 30 years later he would take over Andropov's place at Lubyanka KGB headquarters in Moscow." Unquote. Vladimir Putin turned 17 years old in October 1969, and the next summer, the teenager arrived at Lutyeny Avenue in Leningrad, present day St. Petersburg, building number four, and knocked on its very large, very heavy doors. 
This was not a regular building because it housed the KGB administration of that city. Quote, Putin's wish to work for the KGB emerged, if not in his childhood, then, at the very least, in his youth. Immediately after graduating high school, he visited our administration and announced right there in the doorway, quote, I want to work here, end quote. These are the words of Putin's future boss in an interview he gave to the Komsomolska Pravda newspaper. And the staff that day was quite surprised because it wasn't very common for young men, teenagers, to just show up on their doorstep and demand that they work there. So they advised Putin that he needs to uh, do some additional work, that is, either join the military and complete his service, or graduate from university. What Putin himself had publicly stated is that his initial dream job was to be a pilot, but around the age of 16, he changed his mind in favor of becoming a KGB officer and working for state security services. It's quite likely that his grandfather's Spiridon's experience working for the Soviet system on the inside also played a certain role in the young man's decision. However, Maria and Vladimir, his parents, had envisioned a very different future for their son. They wanted him to be an engineer. So when Putin realized that he had to meet additional requirements, he asked the staff at the KGB building in Leningrad what university they preferred. And they told him that they preferred the law school. So he applied at, to, to study at the Leningrad University at the law department located on the 22nd line of the Vasilevsky Island in the central part of the city. The young man overcame, quote, all the hurdles and was admitted to his faculty of choice upon the very first attempt, end quote. Alexander Rar writes, so what were those hurdles? Well, parental resistance was one significant factor. And second, Putin either needed a recommendation letter from the district party committee or the Young Communist League Komsomol, or he required excellent high school grades upon graduation. So obviously he met these requirements, which Rar attributes to the young man's persistence in pursuing his goal. When Putin turned 18 years old, the dissident writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn won the Nobel Prize in Literature, undoubtedly a highly politicized move in the context of the Cold War to stick it to the Soviet Union. Had Putin read Solzhenitsyn? Some speculate that by then he may have read One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisevich, which is a fictional work about a camp prisoner. So what did Putin think about his foreign award? Well, it seems that the young man's main concern was not these events in Solzhenitsyn's status in the West, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, but his main concern was that he was too young to pursue his chosen profession of working for the KGB. Now, on the one hand, Putin once publicly defended the state's right to use informants to obtain certain types of information. On the other hand, Alexander Rar argues, quote, it is highly unlikely that Vladimir Putin wanted to work in the senseless and unenviable field of going after dissidents. There is no doubt that Putin was attracted to different kinds of activities within the KGB. So what were they? To understand what the young Putin may have been attracted to, we need to briefly look at international relations in the early 1970s. So that year, the West German Chancellor, Willy Brandt, in the American-dominated West, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, focused on what he called Ostpolitik, the policy 
of improving relations with the Soviet Union, specifically and the so-called Eastern Bloc in general. In fact, Brand received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1971 for this very effort. The result of this effort was the shift toward a detente, including many positive developments in Europe. For example, West Germany not only became the main trading partner for the Soviet Union on the continent, but the two sides also signed an agreement for initiating natural gas supplies from the Soviet Union to the Federal Republic of Germany in 1970. And while the subject is beyond the scope of this particular video, I think it's fascinating to look at the development of the energy relationship between Russia, continental Europe, specifically the, in some ways, uh, energy-starved Germany, in light of the current energy wars today, in which Germany has quite a subservient role within the Anglo-American bloc to its detriment, in my opinion. Now, Putin probably watched the news of Willy Brandt's visit to Moscow in this context in August 1970, which led to establishing the framework for future relations between Russia and the West German state, as well as signing the Treaty of Moscow. So it's quite likely that these events may have shaped his thinking. Alexander Rahr writes, quote, did Vladimir Putin want to become a Soviet James Bond? Hardly. First, he lacked the necessary training. He did not serve in the military. However, all faculties at the university had military departments. So Putin, much like the other students, did not need to wear epaulets and carry a gun. Of course, Putin had to attend military training in his final year. However, he and his peers likely interpreted them as a kind of gym class with a somewhat greater load. After graduating from university, Putin was given the title of lieutenant in the reserve." End quote. So it was then that the young Vladimir Putin's dream came true when he was in his fourth year of university in 1974. He received a phone call from a KGB officer asking him to meet. The young man was understandably very excited. He showed up at the designated meeting place the next day and he waited and waited and waited. And he started feeling tremendously disappointed, thinking that the officer would never show. But eventually he did. And not only did he show up to the meeting, but he actually offered a job to the young Vladimir Putin. Now, this kind of a job offer only came to three other students from his faculty because the KGB was looking for the proverbial best and brightest and the most promising men to join state security. Now, at that time, KGB officers not only had really good income, but they also received special training at the KGB intelligence school. So for some young men, this was A, a prestigious job, and B, it just, it was cool. However, it took another year for Vladimir Putin to receive an official job offer to work at the KGB. His university thesis was about international trade. He graduated, he received the top grade for, for for this for this thesis he graduated from law school and in October 1975 he turned 23 and that is when he began working for state security in the KGB now discussing what we know of Putin's work for the KGB and what we can extrapolate based on historic circumstances would have us sitting here for another hour. So for the sake of brevity, let's summarize. In 1975, Vladimir Putin had the rank of senior lieutenant of justice in the territorial KGB system. Two years later, he served in counterintelligence at the investigative department of the KGB in the Leningrad region. 
1979, after completing retraining courses in Moscow, he returned to his native city. In 1984, Putin had the rank of Major Justice. He studied at the Institute of the KGB, focusing on foreign intelligence. There, he continued to focus on learning the German language and was ultimately trained to work in East Germany. From 1985 until 1990, the future Russian president worked in East Germany through the first main directorate of the KGB, which was responsible for foreign intelligence. He was also the director of the USSR East Germany Friendship House in Dresden. Putin was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He also served as the senior assistant to the head of the department. In 1989, Vladimir Putin was awarded the Bronze Medal for Merit to the National People's Army of the German Democratic Republic. In a 2017 interview, Putin described the fact that his work in Germany sometimes involved interacting with the so-called illegals, Soviet citizens who relied on assumed identities in foreign countries. This is what he stated. Not everyone can give up their present life, give up their loved ones and relatives, and leave the country for many, many years, dedicating their lives to serving the fatherland. Only the chosen ones can do this. I am saying this without any exaggeration. The illegal staffers of intelligence live with this approach towards work, with this approach toward their country, and toward their people. They are unique. End quote. In 1990, Putin returned to Leningrad, which was about to become St. Petersburg after the devastating collapse of the Soviet Union. He worked at the Leningrad KGB department, refusing to transfer to the central apparatus of foreign intelligence of the KGB in Moscow. Putin also became an assistant to the rector of the Leningrad State University in the realm of international relations. And he uh, also eventually began assisting the city's mayor, Anatoly Sapchak, that consequently at one point led to his resignation from the KGB. Just a few years later, on December 31st, 1999, Putin became acting president as Boris Yeltsin resigned. But that is another story. This is all I have for you guys, for those of us who are interested in the history of the Cold War and espionage and other exciting subjects. This is a pretty fascinating story. How do you think uh, some of the skills that Putin gained working for state security affected his leadership style? I think his knowledge of German and his being a Germanophile really shaped uh, his relationship to, to Europe for a time. So I'm interested in hearing your comments and I will see you in the next video. Thank you and bye.